Hello, my friends. This is just such a huge news day that three stories is not sufficient. This is four stories, and then there's multiple stories within three of the four stories. So hold on tight. Here we go. There was a new package of U.S. sanctions. The British piled in as well. The Russians are no longer trading in dollars. They're going to have to do uh, direct exchanges like Russian to the Chinese yen or some other thing, but they, they're not going to be able to do this with the dollar anymore. And that is a significant blow to the Russian economy. New, uh, new U.S. sanctions against Russia have caused an immediate suspension of trading in dollars and euros on the country's leading financial marketplace, the Moscow Exchange. Why they didn't do this before, I just don't understand, but Okay. Uh, the exchange, also known as MOEX, uh, and the Russian Central Bank rushed out statements on Wednesday, a public holiday in Russia, within an hour of Washington announcing a new round of sanctions aimed at cutting the flow of money and goods to sustain Moscow's war in Ukraine. Quote, due to the introduction of restrictive measures by the United States against the Moscow Exchange Group, exchange trading and settlements of deliverable instruments in U.S. dollars and euros are suspended. Many Russians hold savings in dollars or euros, mindful of periodic crises in recent decades when the ruble has crashed in value. And so they're trying to hang on to all their dollars, which tells you what they think about the ruble. Okay. Uh, in coordinated action with G7 partners, the UK announced 50 new sanctions designations and specifications targeting the Russian shadow fleet, financial institutions, and military suppliers. So the UK was piling on. This line here, these people are trying to get their money out of the bank because people are queuing up trying to, there was literally a run on the bank. I don't think this is the end. I don't think this is going to change everything, but it's a pretty significant hit to the Russian economy. Financial Markets Infrastructure Professor at HSE National Research University in Moscow, Yevgeny Kogan, anticipates multiple dollar exchange rates, a central bank rate, an interbank rate, and the real rate on the black market, recommends stashing dollars under the mattress. <laughs> okay, well, so not surprisingly, Medyev is uh, livid about this. Listen to what he says here. There should be virtually no limits on how Moscow retaliates for maximum damage, the former president has argued, and this was just today. Moscow should use every opportunity to inflict maximum damage on Western nations that have declared a war without rules on Russia. Really? A war without rules? You don't like the sanctions and... Okay. Former President Dmitry Medvedev has argued, Every weakness of the U.S. and its allies should be exploited to undermine them and obstruct life for their citizens, the Russian official said on Thursday, reacting to the latest round of sanctions announced by Washington earlier this week. Are they afraid that we would transfer our arms to the enemies of the Western world? We should send every kind of weapon except nuclear for now. Are they afraid of anarchy and crime waves in large cities? We should help disrupt their municipal authorities. Well, they've already been working at that. Could Russia trigger a war in space, wage psychological warfare campaign against Western citizens so that they tremble under blankets in their cozy homes and unleash a tsunami of fake news to turn their life into a never-ending nightmare in which they cannot distinguish reality from the wildest fiction? They're working on that through social media campaigns. Read the Mueller report. You'll see that clearly. Moscow should obliterate their energy infrastructure, industry, transport, banking, and social services, instill fear over an imminent collapse of all critical infrastructure. The latest round of American restrictions against Russian entities targets energy, metals, mining, as well as the financial sector. Among other things, it has forced the Moscow Stock Exchange to suspend all trade in U.S. dollar and the euro. The package is one of the biggest since the Ukrainian conflict escalated into hostilities in February 2022. He's not happy about it, and the severity of his unhappiness shows you just how important this was. Okay, <laughs> Sergey Sumileni uh, said, I asked ChatGPT app to generate a picture of a Russian ruble, <laughs> and this is what it produced. Okay, so... Now, let's turn our attention to big story number two, the Ramstein, or, or sorry, some somebody in the comments was, uh, told me in German it would be pronounced Rumstein. Okay, thank you for that, by the way. The Rumstein uh, group contact, or the, sorry, the Ukrainian Defense Contact Group, 
Rumstein format, which takes place in Brussels. The main topic was uh, artillery and air defense, and they talked about other things with these 50 partner countries. Here is Jen Soltenberg, the uh, NATO Secretary General. Here is the American Secretary of Defense, the American um, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, and the Ukrainian Defense Chief. So they were talking about a lot of things, but here's what came out of it today. U.S. does not expect significant Russian breakthrough in Ukraine's Kharkiv region. Now that's a big turnaround from about three weeks ago. The U.S. does not expect Russia to mount significant breakthrough in its offensive against the Kharkiv region in northeast Ukraine, the Pentagon said on Thursday. A couple of weeks ago, there was concern that we would see significant breakthrough on the part of the Russians, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin said. I don't think we will see that going forward. I don't see a large ex exploitation force that could take advantage of a breakthrough. Austin and Chairman of the Joint Chiefs Brown told reporters, following a meeting of the Ukraine defense contact group in Brussels. So that's good news that this is the way that they're seeing it now. It turns out when you provide Ukrainians with the weapons that they need, turns out they can do it. Secretary General Soltenberg also proposed a week or so ago, $100 billion over five years, and then that transformed into $40 billion annually ongoing. And they didn't say how long ongoing was, but ongoing. And here is Soltenberg talking about that. Uh, financial commitment to support Ukraine will bring more predictability, it will bring more accountability and also uh, ensure that we have burden sharing uh, between allies. And all of this will ensure that we have a more robust uh, support for Ukraine. NATO allies have provided unprecedented support for Ukraine. At the same time, uh, we saw uh, during the winter uh, serious delays. The U.S. spent six months agreeing uh, a new package and, uh, and also some European allies uh, made announcements that what was not turned into a, a reality that was not delivered. So uh, and both of those are very fair points, not just what happened in the U.S., but that things, you know, we're going to have you a, a million shells. Well, they didn't really materialize and they're still working on it. Uh, I have proposed uh, um, uh, a long term commitment, 40 billion uh, as a baseline minimum every year and this will uh, give uh, Ukraine uh, new fresh money every year which is uh, critical for them to uh, prevail as a sovereign independent nation right how do you how do you counterattack when you don't know, you know what you have right now but you don't know what's happening in months from now or a year from now will i have the the backfill of supply in order to keep that momentum going you can't plan without that and so this is a very important step okay the g7 big story number 3 the g7 leaders were meeting today too they agreed to lend ukraine 50 billion using frozen russian assets so this was important as well because these leaders have decided how they're going to play this but it's interesting how they came to this because they were trying to work out the details listen to this usa eu confirm readiness not to unfreeze russian assets until kiev receives reparations so until russia they're not getting their 300 400 billion that is frozen back yet until they pay reparations for what they've done to ukraine the United States and EU countries have agreed to block sanctioned Russian assets until the Russian Federation pays reparations for the invasion of Ukraine, the Associated Press said, citing its own high-ranking U.S. source. That clears the way for leaders to announce the $50 billion loan package for Ukraine at the G7 summit, where President Joe Biden is set to sign a security agreement with Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky. So that's important because if now they're saying, nope, Russia's going to have to pay reparations and they can keep using the interest on this money for as long as it takes. In bigger news than even that, the United States and Ukraine signed a 10-year bilateral security agreement. I think this is the 15th one now, the bilateral security agreements that have been made with Ukraine and other countries. The parties recognize this agreement as support a supporting bridge to Ukraine's eventual membership in the NATO alliance. It was some fantastic news today. Here's Biden uh, and Zelensky signing and some commentary about it from CPS. News from Italy, where President Biden is meeting with other world leaders at the this year's G7 summit. They got a big agenda including talking about more aid for Ukraine as it tries to hold off Russia's army. Nancy Cordes is there in southern Italy for us. She's covering the G7. The weather looks good. Nancy, good morning. 
<laughs> it sure is nice, Tony. Uh, the big news today is this long-term security agreement that President Biden is going to be signing with Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky. It essentially commits the U.S. to supporting Ukraine for the next 10 years. We're talking about military training, weapons assistance, intelligence sharing, and more. 15 other nations have already signed similar. Okay, so it's 16 then. The U.S. agreement will be the 16th. But this is huge. Uh, it, it's So not to minimize, but with some smaller countries, this might not be a big thing. But when the U.K. and Germany and France sign on and the U.S., this is this is big stuff. Agreements And this deal does not commit any U.S. troops to Ukraine's fight against Russia. Now, this signing is going to come about a week after Biden met with Zelensky during his trip to France. And you might recall Biden publicly apologized during that meeting to Zelensky for the six-month congressional delay in approving more military aid to Ukraine. Here in Italy, Biden and the other G7 leaders are hoping to finalize a plan for a $50 billion loan to Ukraine so that the country can do things like rebuild infrastructure that has been destroyed, produce more of its own weaponry so it doesn't have to rely on the rest of the world. And here's the interesting part. The loan would be paid back using the interest from Russian assets that have been frozen by countries around the world since Russia invaded Ukraine two and a half years ago. Uh, right. And this is back this, to is this a good, agreement. This is a good plan as opposed to just using the assets directly and stealing from them and giving it to Ukraine, which I know a lot of people wanted to do. Uh, it, this splits the difference between using it and not doing anything about it in, in a way. And that creates a sustainableness to it as well. For a moment, it is meant to send a message to Russia that the U.S. is not going anywhere, even if this war drags on. But it is not binding. It is not a treaty, which means it could be rolled back by Donald Trump if he wins in November. Gail? Okay, two important things at the end. Uh, one, it could be rolled back by Trump. I don't know if he will or won't do that or what exactly would happen if he came to power. But the other thing there is that this sends a powerful message. Another $40 billion every year from NATO. This $50 billion from the G7. It's sending a message to Russia, no, this is still going to keep happening, and we're, we haven't lost our focus on Ukraine, which is exactly what, what Russia wants. Last big story, this is the fourth. I thought this was really important. And it's important because it's, it's taking ground back from what is traditionally a Russian stronghold. Uh, South America, uh, Africa, the global south, Russia seems to do pretty well there with their messaging. Well, Argentina began to support Ukraine more actively after the election of President Javier Milei uh, in November 2023. President Zelensky participated in his inauguration at the time. Also, Argentina joined the Coalition for the Return of Ukrainian Children. And like, so... Argentina is a legit big country in South America. If you, if you can find the equivalent of that in Africa and you can let that message spread in the global south as support for Ukraine, that would be a big problem for Russia. Russia depends on global south support. Russia takes for granted the support for Russia or at least neutrality from the global south. Okay, those are the four big stories for today. They are some big big stories. This was all good news. Thank you for your time. Thank you for the likes, the shares, the subscribes, and thank you for being the kind of person that cares about Ukraine.